I'm extremely grateful to be here, and I am so impressed that the Shakespeare Authorship Trust has attracted the greatest, worldwide greatest scholar on the Earl of Essex, Paul Hammer, this morning. We've been incredibly lucky to hear um, as close as we can get to the actual story of the Essex Rising, and I feel very humbled and honoured to follow on from him. He has told us the story, and I'm going to try and tell you what I see of as the backstory. And with all backstories, we're going to roll back um, seven years, and uh, I'm going to start with the odd fact that the most popular works, the works that made Shakespeare's name, are works that most of us have never read and some of us have probably never heard of. They're tucked away at the end of his complete works uh, like a couple of ugly ducklings. And in fact, talking about them at one point, somebody bought up a book of Shakespeare's complete works at the end with those last two works cut out neatly by their great-grandfather. Why was that? Um, they were the only two works that Shakespeare actually dedicated to the Earl of Southampton. As we'll hear, um, a lot of us think the sonnets might have been. But the kosher, the works we know were dedicated to Southampton, were Venus and Adonis and Rape of Lucrece. Those poems, which we might think are not much of a gift to the young Earl, were a tremendous gift and probably made his name. Those two poems were runaway hits. They were among the two top bestsellers of the day. Um, Venus ran into 16 editions by 1640, and the poems made him a byword for popularity. And I expect a lot of people here know that um, a lot of the first allusions and references to Shakespeare are not to Shakespeare the playwright. They're to Shakespeare, the author of um, Venus and Adonis and Rape of Lucrece. Uh, in 1599, in a, a skit on the literary scene, known as the Parnassus Plays, a smitten Shakespeare fan says, uh, I'll have, uh, forget Chaucer and Spencer, I'm going to have Shakespeare's picture in my study at the court. I'll worship sweet master Shakespeare, and to honour him will lay his Venus and Adonis under my pillow not the work most of us would have chosen. And another scholarly commentator at the time said the wiser sort preferred his Rape of Lucrece and Hamlet to his other works. Imagine putting those two on a level. Um, so they were widely admired and imitated. They were his first and greatest hits. Now, um, we don't agree, do we? Uh, and yet we agree with the popular estimate at the time of his plays. Uh, to us, they seem, now let's see if I can do this, uh, yes, um, like those rather dead classical Renaissance pictures where the main subject gets lost in all the detail, like this picture, 1593, of a smitten Venus pursuing the young and beautiful Adonis. Well, I defy you to see where that's actually happening. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, there is, uh, let's see. The second subject here, um, the rape of Lucrece, whose suicide after her rape by a Roman prince triggers the downfall of the Tarquin kings. And here is another problem that strikes us with the poems. They are mannered, dreary, and artificial, and unrealistic, like this picture. Just not what we expect of Shakespeare, the, the master of realism. So why did these stories, why did this treatment move them? Uh, modern critics, one of them, the, the great editor of, of Rape of Lucrece, actually says it's overstocked with words, which is not, not really great praise. And Hazlitt, Hazlitt said that these poems were like a couple of ice houses, as hard, as glittering, and as cold. A very good description. So Hazlitt always is good. And we react the same way. For us, they're full of long digressions, showy and perhaps brilliant rhetoric, pointless ornament, and much of it doesn't even make much sense. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, this is a familiar experience with Shakespeare, isn't it? Not perhaps on that scale. For a while, it can be profound and crystal clear, talks in monosyllables, instantly accessible, and then he can, for no apparent reason, suddenly veer off into something incomprehensible. Now, I don't know how many of you have been watching The Upstart Crow. 
Uh, I really recommend it if you haven't, but where's it gone? Yep. Uh, one of the running gags in the upstart crow is that Shakespeare is forever needlessly complicating simple stories so that nobody can understand them. And of course, his wife could easily do the whole thing better. Um, and obviously, Dryden, John Dryden, thought the same thing because a generation after Shakespeare, uh, Dryden rewrote Shakespeare's plays very successfully, cutting out all the boring bits. <laughs> Now, my first book, Shadow Play, took this bipolar aspect of Shakespeare's work uh, as its starting point. And it made the controversial claim that these dense and difficult patches where we wander off, uh, where the footnotes are always silent, you want to find out what they're about, footnotes don't know, that are nearly always cut by directors or masterfully slid over by great actors, these are just the most visible indications that almost all Shakespeare's works have a consistent political subtext. And these awkward, um, anomalous bits are the places where the subtext breaks the surface, where the subtext briefly takes precedence and becomes the text. The metatext becomes the text. And with certain works, this underlying text actually is what people read the work for. Now, why have we overlooked the possibility that some may have seen him as primarily a political writer? Well, basically, because historians like Paul Hammer didn't come along a lot sooner. For centuries, we have approached him with a partial view of the times, blinkered because it was based entirely on the history written by the winners. And we've had a very good impression there from Paul in minute detail of how brilliant these boys were at rewriting history, what an eye they had on posterity and indeed on, on immediate political repercussions. Um, the times... Um, we were brought up, I was brought up at school to think that these were, were glorious times for England when we took our, our sort of great leap forward under Gloriana. But these two poems belong to a whole school of poems written at the same time that are similarly dark, knotted, complex, and they all have the same subject. Now, I haven't seen anybody to pick out one aspect of this same subject. They're all about rape. They're all about a woman being raped. Uh, some actually about a man being raped. But the rapist is always a monarch, a monarch who is a tyrant. And they're historical monarchs. King John, for instance, is one of them. Uh, now, the subject is carefully hidden and deniable. The titles don't say what's in the tin. The titles are Rosamond, Matilda, Shaw's wife, Venus and Adonis, Lucrece, Shakespeare didn't call it the rape of Lucrece. So, uh, you know, they, they, they look like stories about fallen women. But actually, we're looking at studies of the outrageous abuse of royal power, but surely not Tudor power. The uh, traditional um, version of the English Reformation is, is upbeat and, and positive. The power, powerful um, centralizing Tudors laid the basis for um, a great um, modern state. Um, Elizabeth was the, of course, epitome of a wise and moderate ruler. Yes, towards the end of her reign, uh, a political power struggle developed, but happily for England, the foolish, misguided, ambitious Essex went to the block after a failed coup, and Lord Burley's loyal, practical, hard-working son, the spit of his father, masterminded a peaceful succession on Elizabeth's death. And this version has been given a new boost by the brilliantly written novels of Hilary Mantel and the brilliantly uh, written history of uh, histories of, for instance, uh, Dermot McCulloch, a marvellous book about Cromwell. Um, and it's dominated English consciousness for centuries. The story that a country took a giant leap under the charismatic Tudors from superstition, subservience to a corrupt papacy, subjection to an unruly monarchy, to an age of enlightenment, strong leadership, uh, tolerance, parliamentary democracy and empire, mercifully uh, unstained by the religious wars that disfigured the continent. That's, that's the version probably all of us were brought up with. However, we have just heard a very powerful piece of jigsaw of a quite different version. The crisis, according to Paul Hammer and, and um, scholars who follow him, like Alexandra Gadsda, uh, 
the crisis at the end of the reign was not just a personal power struggle between two individuals. It was very nearly the civil war everybody feared. That is, both politicians, Cecil side and the Essex side, mm -hmm. who Paul Hammer showed sat, sat separately on that fated evening, they actually were figureheads for positions in which two sides of a profoundly divided country were invested. The Cecil stood for the status quo, everyone who owed their career to the changes set in motion by Henry VIII would stick by them. But Essex was the magnet for everyone who opposed them. And this was not a small irrelevant band of losers. He found himself riding a pent up wave of resentment, hatred and anger. The storm that Paul has rightly suggested um, uh, was feared uh, would, would result in civil war. Now, Essex's um, broad manifesto and rounded character meant that he appealed to dissidents of all kind. He was all things to all men. How much deliberately, how much not, I don't know. But his persona, and when you get close to him, I would say his personality, but we can talk about this, was militant yet scholarly. He was an aristocrat who kept open house for refugees from England and abroad and who would sit down and talk to anybody of any class. He was extravagant and open-handed. As Paul said, he, he paid for the army out of his own pocket sometimes, the entire army who had not been paid for by the government. And yet he was wholly opposed, opposed to corruption and money grabbing. He was spontaneous and impulsive, and yet, as a member of the Privy Council, he was a meticulous organiser. And above all, he presented himself as a religious tolerationist who appealed to both Puritan and Catholic. Both sides, both, both sides alienated um, by the Elizabethan settlement, believed that in Essex they would find toleration. And, of course, anyone with a grievance against William Cecil sided with him, and that included, crucially, the heir to the throne, James VI of Scotland. And finally, and most importantly to us, it must have included Shakespeare, who grew up um, in an age uh, of, described by two of the great biographers of the age as a terror. He grew up under a terror. Now, I often ask at this point if people know what the building was that Shakespeare mentioned more often than any other. And I just wonder whether anyone would like to answer that question. <laughs> what? Yeah, it's, it's, it's rather, I'm obviously with experts here. <laughs> The tower. Um, some people suggest the globe, which is rather interesting. Um, he does mention it, of course. Um, now, I want to look a little more closely at the grievances of this great tide of dissent, the Elizabethan opposition, a phrase which maybe 10 years ago people thought wouldn't make any sense. Um, this tide that swirled around Essex because it's been written out of history by the winners and because it's critical to understanding the true meaning of Shakespeare's poems hailed in his lifetime as his masterpieces and now closed books literally to us. Now, just as one might say now, the great political issue we would all immediately understand is the number one issue is Brexit. Uh, in those days, the number one issue, the one that was inextricably involved with the succession was religion. And Parsons' book, the Dolman book, as Paul called it, which is a beautifully written book, I would love to talk to Paul afterwards about it. It's, it, to me, a very clear analysis of the situation and of the pros and cons of various kinds of regime change. Um, says the key, the most important uh, subject of all is religion. That's going to be critical to that handover to the next uh, king, as it proved to be. James came in on a Catholic ticket. He offered, in a, in a sneaky James kind of way, Catholic toleration, and he was married, of course, to a Catholic. Um, now, it was religion that was the eventual trigger for civil war in England. So uh, everybody was correct in diagnosing that as the critical um, issue of the day. In the view of many, uh, when Shakespeare began to write, the old pre-Reformation religion was not Roman or Spanish or Popish. It was inseparable from Englishness. Um, and by destroying it, 
In their view, Henry VIII single-handedly destroyed England's historic identity. He, his son, and after a brief interruption, his daughter, um, went on to force an unwilling country on pain of death for treachery to accept a religion the majority, reformers and Catholics, believed was heretical. The collateral damage um, we would mind about, however, more than that, um, was cultural. Mm, under the cloak, it was a phrase that came up a lot at the time, under the cloak of eradicating superstition, the regime that originally gained power under Henry grabbed, wrecked, appropriated, and sold off the national heritage in double quick time. That period was an absolute object lesson in how fast human greed works. And Jack Scarisbrick wrote, between 1536 and 1553, there was destruction and plunder in England of beautiful, sacred, and irreplaceable things on a scale probably not witnessed before or since. And as the monastic libraries were repositories for the National Archive, the loss was incalculable. Andrew Graham Dixon recently said there's only one parallel event, and that was the Chinese Cultural Revolution. By the end of the 16th century, the purge was so complete that the only traces of English medieval art, English alabasters, for instance, which was our great selling point artistically, exist in foreign museums. We would also be indignant at the privatization of the crucial infrastructure of the country's welfare system. Hospitals, almshouses, hostels, safe local refugees for old and, un refugees for old and unmarried women in the community, all these disappeared when the abbeys went down. The loss was spiritual too. The, and this is more difficult for us perhaps, but Eamon Duffy is the writer who is who's very good at getting us into this place. The obliteration of the doctrine of the real presence um, meant that the idea of a, a sacred space, a place in the middle of the community where heaven and earth met in the blessed sacrament at a particular moment in a particular place vanished from every parish. And with that, all the many, many ancient social bonds connected with it vanished too. And the loss of these bonds led to a deep spiritual and economic impoverishment of English social life. Banbury Cross, all the crosses went down, all the market crosses all over England, either then or, or a bit later. Banbury Cross, there were two Banbury Crosses. One was called the Bread Cross. It's called the Bread Cross because that's where bread was handed out every Sunday to the poor. When that went, someone would have to have the character to reinvent a place we, and most people didn't. <coughs> Finally, and perhaps worst of all, the casualty for many was personal integrity. I think this period changed the English character. Under the terms of the Elizabethan set settlement, masterminded by William Cecil. Loyalty to the spiritual authority of the crown was enforced by two simple but characteristically brilliant ideas. First, when she came to the throne, an oath of supremacy was devised, um, which linked loyalty to the queen with an explicit renunciation of the spiritual and temporal authority of the pope. It was anathema to Catholics. Uh, but it was also anathema to reformers who could not accept a secular monarch as head of the church. Um, this oath was required for anybody who wanted a job in public life, JPs, MPs, um, civil servants, teachers. And to go back to MPs, um, there was a nervous, rather, rather low uh, number of Catholics in Elizabeth's first parliament, 71. In uh, 1593, that had sunk to three Catholics in Parliament. Be Catholic in Parliament, you had to take the oath. Um, second brilliant idea, monthly attendance at the new state church was mandatory. Refusing to attend it uh, incurred ruinous fines, 20 pounds a month, annual salary of a grammar school teacher. Tens of thousands of people were exiled or went to prison for refusing the oath or refusing to go to church, recusants. And many, many more outwardly conformed and expected damnation for doing so. Most of us, I think everyone in this room, more or less, would have conformed. Um, but, uh, and, and perhaps we could live with ourselves now. But in an age of faith, it was a very different thing. So, so much for the gentry and the yeomen of England, because this didn't apply to the nobility, who, because of their rank, did not have to swear the oath. 
but they had different and perhaps greater problems. They, Catholic nobility most of all, well, they were all Catholic nobility, of course, were first in the queue, uh, had their trotters in the trough when it came to the share out of the dissolution of the monasteries. So the great Catholic Montague family had, had vast monastic estates, which they were busy uh, privatizing and converting. But now, in Shakespeare's day, these big beasts among the predators themselves were becoming prey to smaller and nimbler predators who'd been in at the first wave and were now turning on these people with the gains from the second. And the embodiment of these nimble second wave of predators was, of course, um, William Cecil. Um, these men were empowered by new legislation enacted back in the days of Henry VII, a nervous, newly installed um, monastic dynasty, a monastic Tudor dynasty, monarchical dynasty. Um, and this new um, order was designed to emasculate the old order and promote biddable lawyers, clerks, and civil servants to rise up in their stead. So by Shakespeare day, this new generation was dominant in central and local government, and the nobility was either neutered or tamed or plucked or in some way or other on the back foot. And one of the great advantages of being among you is that you will all know the Oxfordian story and the tragedy of a man um, uh, who, who was bit by bit destroyed uh, by Lord Burley. So let's go from the top of the social scale now to the bottom. Um, and uh, very overlooked until recently was the impact on the country of Elizabeth's endless and indecisive um, wars. It was, they were fueled by conscription and conscription uh, was on a huge scale. The numbers are enormous of men who died uh, either less in warfare than in womanish mismanagement. Paul mentioned that Elizabeth had, uh, I forget his phrase, a complete lack of understanding of the way war was waged. And that meant an immense loss of manpower. And of course, there was the induced paranoia. Um, the country was on military alert throughout Shakespeare's lifetime in case probably of quite justified fears of invasion, but also because it suited the rather embattled uh, regime in charge. Um, so these thousands of wounded survivors, veterans, unpaid, returned without pensions to beg in the streets. And because um, the poor laws and, and workhouses uh, replaced the old monastic charity, um, they, were, they were cruelly dealt with. And this was something they looked to the compassionate Earl of Essex, these soldiers, who was the soldier, soldier's friend, as someone to put these right. And, and Essex did help these men, as we say, out of their own pocket. And you remember, for every man, there was a whole family that was ruined for every death. So you, you suddenly get an enormous constituency under Essex here. Now, another element in, in the national resentment at the regime was the way these colossal changes in the national psyche were implemented. First, I've mentioned the constant military alerts. Second, um, the huge proliferation of spy services. This was an age of high unemployment and high inflation. You took what money you could get, and one of the easiest ways was, was being a spy. As Paul mentioned, um, in Essex's household, of course, there were spies. There were spies everywhere. Uh, then the gangs of thugs and enforcers who paid themselves uh, for the business of terrorizing recusants, the people who wouldn't step into line. Uh, and they were often rather, one must think of sort of uh, the people galvanized at the, at the height of the Irish troubles, um, Paisleyite extremists. They were bigoted um, uh, religious men, often very simple ideas, and they were delighted to take their revenge on the Catholics who had burnt so many of their co-religionists in the previous reign. So you have an age of sort of low-level terrorism going on. And John Donne in his satires brilliantly describes um, the way they would just grab, say, look, a gold cup, right? That's obviously a chalice. I'm going to take that and you're going into prison. Now, when I wrote my first book, Shadow Play, uh, in 2005, I thought that this loser's history, which I've just outlined, um, expressed with extreme anguish and eloquence in books published abroad, which I had access to and which have been largely repressed ever since, I thought that it was largely Catholic. But I was wrong. 
researching the second book, I came on a long tradition, maybe hidden in plain sight, of Protestant protest. Because let's just look at their situation. They took over the church, uh, and even before this happened, they realized the church infrastructure was just not there. Everything that they hoped to work with had gone and was privatized. They were furious at this, but they were stuck with it because they had ad adopted the Calvinist iconoclastic rather than the Lutheran icon happy um, aspect of, of the reformed religion. The cries of pain and protest at the despoliation began with the reformers themselves under Henry VIII. They stood up in Parliament and said, don't do it. And Anne Boleyn tried to dissuade uh, Henry from seizing the monasteries on purely practical, not religious grounds. Um, and right through to the 19th century, great Protestant scholars and antiquarians, Camden, Dugdale, Burke, uh, Cobbett, Coleridge, even Jane Austen, continued to protest and lament at what Henry VIII had done to England. Uh, Jane Austen wrote um, that, that Henry must have uh, created these ruins, Tintern Abbey, etc., to adorn the landscape. Otherwise, why would a man of no religion himself be at so much trouble to abolish one which had for ages been established in the, ki in the kingdom? Very interesting, so she said. She thanked him for beautifying the landscape with these ruins. Now, it's only with the rise of the welfare state and the decline of religious belief that we began to forget the drastic impoverishment of English life that followed on from the Reformation. Um, now, I just want to give you an idea of the utter apoplectic indignation that is the keynote of the works of, or of those who believe that a greedy cabal uh, under the, the, the umbrella of a tyrannical king had driven the Reformation in England for their own materialistic ends. And I cannot recommend too highly William Cobbett's book, The Protestant Reformation, very hard to get, but it's the best bit of polemic in the English language. It's a rip-roaring read. And um, I just can't resist giving you just a little bit of it. And remember, Cobbett was um, a radical, but he was not a Catholic. He begins the book by saying, I'm not a Catholic. He was a radical reformer, and he saw all around him the terrible results of a country that was beginning to be industrialized um, and that was, uh, had this <coughs> dreadful industrial poverty all around him. The poverty, he suddenly realized, what if the monasteries were here? He went and read Lingard, the great historian neglected of the time, and he realized the family silver had gone. And here he goes. What follows is calculated to make us shudder with horror, to make our very bowels heave with loathing, to make us turn our eyes from the paper and resolve to read no further. From first to last, we have to contemplate nothing that is not of a kind to fill us with horror and disgust. And that book became a bestseller. He said it sold around the world better than the Bible. That was Cobbett, though. Um, but Camden, surprisingly, Elizabeth's historian, he seemed to be the one that, that coined the idea of a storm hitting England, which everybody picked up. It was like the, the tempest was a phrase like prohibition or the blitz. Camden said, a great storm burst upon the English church like a flood breaking down its banks, which to the astonishment of the world and the grief of the nation bore down the greatest part of the religious with their fairest buildings. So this subject, what happened to England, seems to drive everyone who approaches it to extremes of eloquence and despair. They all go into the same sort of sixth gear, or first gear, probably. Um, particularly, uh, indig in, uh, the indignation was at the means by which the religious houses were brought down. Because, accidentally, the government had allowed the phrase, um, how did it go? The great houses of religion in the great houses religion was truly kept. Now this went into law in the legislation that closed down the smaller religious houses under Woolsey. But now they've got it there, that then how are they gonna shut down the great houses? Only by bribing, bullying, coercing, or persuading every single priory, abbey, and monastery to hand over the keys. And it's extraordinary how easily that can be done if your neighbor really wants that monastery or priory. It happened very quickly. But this process was a very ugly process. Now, exactly the same tone of eloquence and despair occurs in the middle of the rape of Lucrece. Here is the same tone of voice, exactly the same list of crimes, 
uh, as those you find in Cobbett and Dugdale, the blackmail, bribes, and threats that made nuns renounce their vows, what you might call vestals renouncing their oaths. And vestals, of course, would apply to nuns and monks. Um, the abbots and communities forced to give away their houses uh, to the crown uh, for, the, for fear of scandal, and which a lot of it has stuck, of course. Um, and the people who, who bought these things, as nowadays, the new men were men who were totally, totally um, self-absorbed, and the whole business of charity had nothing to do with them. Nash, the great satirist, um, uh, had a go at them, as did everybody else. Suddenly, money instead of charity was the new catchphrase. Um, now, uh, these were basically embodiments of opportunism. Uh, and they grabbed everything, whether it was whole estates or doorknobs and tiles. Uh, Shakespeare goes into this diatribe after Lucrece has been raped. There's a long period after she's been raped when she does nothing that a raped woman would do. And one of the things she does is to reflect on society in general and on, <laughs> <laughs> on the nature of opportunism, among other things. And off she goes on opportunism. And what an opportunity for me to have Derek Jacobi here to read this great passage from Shakespeare. And that's, that's the beginning, but Derek is going to read a bit further than that. And it's the bit about opportunity. And I bet you've got something different written down there, have you? Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> O oh, opportunity, thy guilt is great. Thou makest the vestal violate her oath. Thou blowest the fire when temperance is thawed. Thou smotherest honesty. Thou murderest troth. Thou foul begetter. Thou notorious bored. Thou plantest scandal and displacest lord. Thou ravisher, thou traitor, thou false thief, thy honey turns to gall, thy joy to grief. When wilt thou be the humble suppliant's friend, and bring him where his suit may be obtained? When wilt thou sort an hour great strifes to end, or free that soul which wretchedness hath chained? Give physic to the sick, ease to the pained. The poor, lame, blind, halt, creep, cry out for thee. But they ne'er meet with opportunity. The patient dies while the physician sleeps. The orphan pines while the oppressor feeds. Justice is feasting while the widow weeps. Advice is sporting while infection breeds. Thou grants no time for charitable deeds. Wrath, envy, treason, rape, and murder's rages. Thy heinous hours wait on them as their pages. Guilty thou art of murder and of theft, guilty of perjury and subornation, guilty of treason, forgery and shift, guilty of incest, that abomination, an accessory by thine inclination to all sins past and all that are to come, from the creation to the general doom. I think that's the first time since Shakespeare wrote those lines uh, that they've been read as they should be read. Um, and it began to dawn on me, looking at these digressions, that seen from a different angle, these digressions all apply to a different story. The poem is not about the rape of a single woman in distant classical history. It's about the rape of England. 
And in protesting like this, Shakespeare wasn't part of an oppressed minority, not a lonely individual. He was part of the distinguished intellectual mainstream then and for the next three centuries. And he is speaking with their voice, using their knowledge, their points of reference. So let's just look again at the, this disaffected mainstream. Who were they? Um, they were churchmen who'd lost out on the infrastructure of their church. They were um, the imprisoned, exiled, and oppressed Catholics. They were the uh, guilty, uh, compromised uh, church papists, as they called themselves, people who, who pay, paid lip service. Um, they were the veterans and conscripts. They were the cultivated, scholarly, and humane who saw the uh, national heritage disappear under the hammer. Um, and there were those who, who were politically alert and knew that civil war was now around the corner. Um, to all these people, this man offered solutions. I'm very interested by this picture, actually. It's, some very, it's the most modern portrait I've seen of a, a Tudor figure. Um, the solutions he offered were first a secure succession, uncertainty over which was becoming critical. Very early in, in his career, now you will hear I'm a pro-Essex girl, um, he saw that the secure succession was crucial and he set up a line of communication secretly uh, with James, James VI, knowing, uh, as we've just heard, that there was a division, uh, he was on, not on speaking terms, with the Cecil. Um, the second was to end corruption and self-interest in government. Thank goodness I don't have to describe that. Paul Hammer has just, in, in one long sentence, uh, uh, given us a, a picture of the horrendous corruption uh, initiated, inaugurated by Lord Burley. And the third was to introduce toleration. Um, Puritans and Catholics joined forces under Essex. Now, this aspect of Essex's appeal has been totally written out of the history books, and it's Alexandra Gadjda, actually, who has unearthed quite a lot of evidence that, that Essex, whether deliberately or not, put out the idea that, as with Henry IV, a limited form of toleration was possible. And one of his followers, Edwin Sands, um, uh, in, early in, in James's reign, wrote a book really arguing for that. Uh, and, and the proof that that's what he was offering, here is Edward Coke in his trial, Essex's trial. Indicting the conspiracy, he says, he that conspires to take London and surprise the court, this doth merely concern the state. But this Catiline conspiracy to conspire against the queen herself, this concerns more. But the toleration of religion, this of all things, concerns most. And, and that single piece of writing should make us think again about Elizabeth's glorious regime. And of course, these people were so deeply invested <coughs> in the Elizabethan uh, settlement, which they'd enforced for 40 years, that uh, these architects, uh, whose fortunes and reputations were indissolubly linked um, with, with uh, the uh, enforcement of a new state religion, um, they could never accept a new religious order unless they were in control of whoever did it. Uh, to spread his message, Essex, who was a natural scholar, wished he'd stayed at university, commissioned scores of scholars and researchers to find precedents of regime change uh, in classical literature. And my hunch is that certainly Shakespeare's second poem um, were part of this campaign. The only part that survived, of course, the only part that was any good. So now, um, at last, we can take a look at, it, look at them. And um, like all writers, I'm going to say this is... One hates to rush so quickly through this, because with Shakespeare, as always, the beauty is in the detail. And so to do this in a hurried way does it an injustice. But here we go. Um, first one, Venus and Adonis hits the presses in 1593, and it flies off. The story, very briefly, is that the goddess Venus falls for the beautiful earthling, Adonis, who is later killed by a boar and she's stricken. Venus, by the way, was Essex, the Essex Circle code name for Elizabeth. Elizabeth would never have chosen Venus. It was the opposite. She was, she was uh, Cynthia. She was the pure Diana. But they called her Venus. And this first poem is Venus and Adonis. Now, 
With Shakespeare's work, as you probably know, he always has a source. And so the key thing is what are the changes? And the changes are the key indicator as to what he was trying to do. One of the big changes here, which puzzles scholars, is that his Adonis resists Venus. In all the others, it's a come on. Of course, the goddess of love. But he fights her as strenuously as he can. But he is too young and small. Comically, uh, Shakespeare makes Venus much bigger than him. She can actually pick up Adonis, get him off his horse, get him under her arm, <laughs> fling him on the ground, and get on top of him. And that's the opening of the poem, part of the reason, of course, why it flew off the shelves. <laughs> um, and she tries for a whole day to make love to him. She tries everything to persuade him to give in. But he refuses. He says he's too young. He, he, he wants to go hunting. This is not for him. Well, how did he get away with this, which the way I've described it, I think must be obvious there is a parallel. It's dedicated to the Earl of Southampton. Um, well, one of the cleverest ploys that's taken in scholars ever since is to write the whole thing as if Venus is the victim, not Adonis. Adonis is wrong to resist her. So the whole thing is the poor queen, the desperate queen. You feel with the queen. You want Adonis to respond. Um, and so the critics say this is clearly uh, a, 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 um, a reproach to Adonis for not accepting what I'm going to tell you in a minute, Burley wanted him to do. Um, in another change to the myth, well, it was actually happening, of course, once you strip aside the ironic voice and the, the charming sort of sophisticated presentation, is we've got uh, a, a brutal sexual assault on a minor, um, which results directly in Adonis's death. Now, in another change to the myth, the boar isn't just any old hunted animal, as in the story. Shakespeare hijacks the Caledonian boar from further back in Ovid and puts the Caledonian boar there. Now, some of you may know this is a, a supersized monster that starts killing all the Greek heroes until Meliega kills him. But this, this boar was unleashed by a goddess, angry that her altars had not been tended by earthlings. And um, so this description, Shakespeare lifts it from Ovid, the, exactly what the boar looks like. And fascinatingly, the attitude of Venus to the boar is, oh, don't go near that boar. I know all about him. I know what he does. And when eventually the boar does kill Adonis, she, she identifies with him. She says, it was me really. Had I been toothed like him, I would have killed him too. And there's this weird, again, sort of, uh, sort of fascinating um, undercurrent in this poem of what exactly is going on. And a, a sexual a analyst would, would have a great time with this poem. But as so often with Shakespeare, when he sails close to the wind in comedy or sexu sexual comedy, um, there's politics underneath it. So, um, had I been toothed like him, I must confess, with kissing him, I should have killed him first. But the more you look at the detail of this boar, the closer the links are with someone called Richard Topcliffe and the likes of him. That is Elizabeth's enforcers. Topcliffe with a sadistic butcher who claimed to be the queen's lover. And one of the first readers of Venus and Adonis was a deranged soldier begging for a pension called William Reynolds. And we have his written response to the poem. Um, uh, and he, he says plainly that Venus is the queen and he, Adonis, he is Adonis. So he sees this as a, as a kind of um, uh, attack on him, not just on Adonis. And throughout, uh, uh, Venus's love is not just possessive. She says, I'll be a park and thou shalt be my dear. And that sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But actually, a deer park is where deer are killed. And he drives that home by saying, no dog shall rouse thee, though a thousand bark. So it's a deer park with a thousand dogs in it. Um, so the love is lethal. Three times it's described as tyrannous. She murders with a kiss. And um, there's a wonderful little, I think we're going to be very lucky here. Uh, he, describes, she describes, he describes at one point um, Adonis as a little bird. And uh, the, the queen um, is, is like an eagle eating the little bird. And I don't know whether, Derek, you have this bit there. Um. Even as an empty eagle, shot by fast, tires with her beak on feathers, flesh, and bone, shaking her wings, devouring all in haste, till either gorge be stuffed or prey be gone. 
Even so, she kissed his brow, his cheek, his chin, and where she ends, she doth a new begin. Wonderful. The opposition of love and lust was, was a trope at this time, and it was used politically. Love was connected with transcendence, with something objectively good. Lust is self-centered. So you've got the money and the old, the old, more charitable world order. And part of the orchestration of this poem uh, is, is the oscillation between love, which Adonis pathetically remembers what love was like. That little passage is mocked by critics at being prissy. And, and the lust which the queen so, so thoroughly embodies. Um, I think, have I got another? Yes, here we go. Uh, so here is the love and lust bit. And also here we have the word caterpillars, which comes into Richard III, which Essex used in his last stand. He said, I'm trying to get rid of the caterpillars around the king. And uh, in, this, in this little quote, which have you got there in, on your sheet? <laughs> and tyrants. Um, you can see it there to save time, just run through it, and you will see um, uh, it's feeding on beauty, the hot tyrant stains like caterpillars do the tender leaves. So you see this sort of political subtext jumping up and down throughout this highly charged poem. Now, it's worth recalling that um, the young Catholic uh, peer, Southampton, just reaching the age of 21, was a very conspicuous symbol of the devouring nature of Elizabeth's regime. He was probably conceived in the tower on a um, compassionate visit. His father died when he was a boy as a result of a second stint in the tower, imprisoned because of suspected Catholic sedition. Uh, Southampton's grandparents and cousins, the Montagues, had just fallen from favour for the same reason. He himself grew up as a ward of court like Oxford, and in 1593 had just refused, the year of this poem, to uh, marry Lord Burley, his guardian's choice of bride. Obviously, Lord Burley's granddaughter, Lord Burley's great aim being to marry right in to the British his English aristocracy. His, um, if he didn't marry his guardian's choice of bride, he had to pay a sum, 5,000 pounds then, it's millions now. Um, and it looks as if he paid it. Uh, people couldn't believe this. His estates he discovered when he woke up to what was going on had been mismanaged in standard form and asset stripped during his minority. Looked very much as if this young man would suffer the same fate as the Earl of Oxford. Um, but in fact, his effeminacy was a pose. He was a canny operator, practical and decisive, and he was to escape the clutches of Lord Burley, one of the few who did, marry happily on his own terms, and rescue his fortune. So Adonis's resistance to Venus, who says, shall we, shall we make the match? His protest that he was too young for love exactly echoes Southampton's own excuse for refusing Lord Burley's granddaughter at this, at, uh, on, on the grounds of age. He wrote a letter saying, I'm too young. So he could read himself into, into Adonis, but so could Reynolds, the soldier, and so could thousands of others destroyed by the ravaging bore of Elizabeth's enforcers for refusing to reciprocate the love of the sovereign, sovereign so often expressed in Elizabeth's speeches. And you know, they were always couched in terms of a love affair with, with her true spouse, the, um, the English people, and for retaining a link to an older, outlawed and discredited English identity. Um, Rape of Lucrece, written just as Essex was beginning to canvass the Catholic vote and to protect Jesuit priests, he brought a Jesuit priest over in 1594 and housed him very controversially. This would have been a gift to um, Essex's public relations campaign. We must imagine here a widening of the screen after the little jeweled uh, uh, work of art that was Venus, uh, Venus and Adonis to epic dimensions. And this time, Shakespeare has chosen a theme that would appeal not just to Catholics, the nobility, and the military, but to the entire rainbow coalition gathering under Essex, to Anglican clerics, scholars, antiquarians, and so on. Because in the slow motion description of the rape of Lucrece, he portrays in parallel the slow motion destruction of the soul of the country by a lust-driven, greedy monarch, complicated by the church's initial passivity and later resistance to the act of supremacy. 
he portrays to its continuing downfall right through to his own time, the 1590s, at the hands of a corrupt and self-serving cabal led by Lord Burley, and there's a pen portrait of Lord Burley bang in the middle of this poem. His immense canvas brilliantly includes a wealth of detail, again airing all the key issues of the day. People have read this, read this rather like reading New Statesman or The Spectator, that it's a think piece exploring the pros and cons of this and that of a major, major um, public, public issue. Just to quickly give you an idea of the changes that puzzle scholars and have no answer. One is that Shakespeare opens it with a big question. Why did Lucrece's husband, why did he show her off? Why did he dangle her in the eyes of Tarquin, who of course goes off and rapes her. Why did he show the king that he had this treasure, which he said was actually better than anything that the actually son of a king, but Shakespeare switches it to king. Why did he do that? And in every detail, in the choice of words, in the choice of language, in the way it parallels other accounts, by Lodge, for instance, this is the story of what started the Reformation in England in the eyes of everybody at that time in the first two centuries. Woolsey, Woolsey's conspicuous consumption, Woolsey's demo of how you, how you dissolve a monastery and make, make money out of it, that was what began it. So it was an own goal by the church. This was an acceptable way, of course, for Anglicans to say, how did this disaster happen? Well, it was the church's fault. They were, it was Woolsey's fault. So that's one, that explains and shows why Shakespeare begins it with, with the really guilty man, the guardian of Lucrece who wasn't a guardian, he opened out the church to this, this raid. Um, and most daring of all, um, and I only discovered this, as the book went to press, I had to recall it, put it in, is that someone called John Leslie was a leading Catholic uh, recusant, Bishop of Ross, Scottish. He uh, was one of the reasons to talk, uh, that, he, uh, that Shakespeare's Southampton went to the tower because he was seen talking to the Bishop of Ross. And John Leslie, from abroad, wrote a very widely read book, although it was banned, it was on a level with the Dolman book, called A Treatise of Treasons. And in a central part of the Treatise of Treasons is Leslie saying, look, you English, do you know what it's like? Your country is like the siege of Troy. It's like the moment when Troy uh, has the horse outside it and Troy foolishly accepts the wooden horse because Sinon has, has talked you into it. Who is Sinon? Lord Burley, the Machiavel, and he goes into a hammering attack on Burley and Bacon. Shakespeare, in this long, long moment after Lucrece has been raped, in a moment that's in a way realistic, she's waiting for her husband to come so she can tell him what's happened. She doesn't know what to do, so she goes to look at a picture of the fall of Troy in her house. And she, uh, he takes pages on this, um, this, this description of the picture, but in the middle of it is the person, she actually claws at his face, she actually attacks the canvas, Sinon. And the description of Sinon is not the classical description. It's uh, taken from uh, the eulogistic descriptions of your Lord Burley at the time, his moderateness, his mildness, uh, the, the, the persona is that of Burley, it's fascinating. And we know that Shakespeare read the Treatise of Treasons um, because uh, a little quote from it comes in Richard III and that was uh, identified by a Shakespeare scholar called Lily Campbell. So there is a strong link there. Uh, but how people have missed that, that uh, Shakespeare there is giving a portrait of this is what it's like now and this is whose fault it is. And I'm going to end this bit on the rape of Lucrece with another little um, extract just to show you when you say the devil's in the detail, the detail and the beauty of Shakespeare's um, wordmanship in um, uh, this poem. Now, wait a minute, see, here we are. Uh, I think, did we get that picture? There it is, being raped. Here it is. This is the opening verse of The Rape of Lucrece. Openings are hugely important for Shakespeare. He uh, takes pride, I think, in setting out his stall, uh, not just on, 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 the, on the literal level, but on the inner level. And if you can see puns in this, if you see puns anywhere where in Shakespeare, they are there. On the besieged Ardea, all in post, borne by the trustless wings of false desire, lust-breed Tarquin leaves the Roman host, 
And to Collatium bears the lightless fire Which in pale embers hid Lurks to aspire and girdle with embracing flames The waste of Collatine's fair love Lucrece the chaste there's time here just to point out the pun on leaving the Roman host, a king that leaves the Roman host. Um, and the second pun, a uh, double fire, by the way, was often used, the false and the true fire for the false and the true religion that would have worked then, not now. But waste, there is always a pun there. Um, he makes it elsewhere, waste and waste. So we're looking at uh, an exploration of the forces that will lay waste to England. So both poems express the dilemma of thousands in England who objected to the invasive oath which brazenly required perjury as a condition of loyalty. In Macbeth, he talks about someone talk, Macduff says, Macbeth demands mouth honor, breath, which the poor heart would fain deny and dare not. And this dreadful quotation, Elizabeth said, she did not want to make windows into men's souls. What else is an oath but to corrupt the soul into which she does not want to make a window? She just wants the lip service, but in those days, the lips and the heart had to be one. And a traitor in Macbeth, who's a traitor, uh, the little boy asks, someone who swears and lies. These poems are, of course, written under censorship. And they were written for men whose spirits are full of anguish, wrote Philip Sidney, being forced to oaths they account damnable, burdened with their weight of their consciences, men of great number. And Lucrece, the poem, replaces the word rape with act, capitalised twice, four times. May my pure mind with the foul act dispense. Now the answer for her is no, she cannot, and this makes her a heroine and she kills herself, and has been an icon for Republican movements ever since. Um, but they're both Rembrandt, Rembrandt's marvellous pictures of, um, of, of Lucrece and her state of mind. But you know, this very different picture, Shakespeare did not agree, going by this poem, that uh, martyrdom, uh, is the right response to tyranny. The correct response to tyranny at the end of this poem is resistance. And Lucius Junius Brutus, the hero, steps forward and says, Lucrece was wrong to kill herself. This is what we should do. We should rise up and with one consent, remove the guilty men. And that's what happened um, in the poem. Rome rose up and removed the Tarquins. But Shakespeare is very careful to say at the beginning and the end, with one consent, he stresses that, and that's picked up by scholars, very unlike him to repeat himself word for word like that, with one consent. A bloodless coup is what people hoped of Essex, led by honourable men, followed by the whole country. Um, now, we're running, running really out of time. I was going to end with Southampton, who of course has been traduced and whose image is tarnished uh, by his persona, Let's just look at it for fun. This was always thought to be a picture of woman for, for, for many years. It's actually of the young Southampton. This is how we see him, the sort of uh, um, uh, effeminate um, object, the master mistress of my passion. This is how we, how we like to see, see him. And also a fool who became involved in a treacherous conspiracy. But we omit this man. His armour actually was confiscated by the government when he was 18, uh, at the time of the Spanish Armada, I've got the dates right, um, like that of all young Catholic noblemen. What, a, what a, an insult to a nobleman to have your armour confiscated. And I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the, the fact that the armour is so conspicuous there is the kind of riposte to that. And finally, there is this picture, which I can't resist ending with. Um, here he is in the Tower of London. He, again, this is thought to be, you know, the, the whimsicality, the folly, the sort of vanity and the unreliability of Southend, had himself painted with his long hair in the Tower. Um, and um, with a cat, you know, his pet cat that was supposed to be, you know, what a fop. Paint yourself in the Tower with a cat. But if you look in the top right, there is the Tower of London, proudly underneath, um, imprisoned but in chains, 
is written in, in Latin, and underneath the years that he was in the tower. Now, what's very interesting is his successors, um, his descendants, have a copy of this picture, and they have had it copied without the little picture of the tower at the top. The late unpleasantness, which our ancestor was involved with, is not part of the picture. Um, this is just a Southampton looking bit. But if you look closely at the picture, you will see his suffering. He, in fact, nearly died in the tower. He couldn't hold up his arms. I don't, it's unclear what he had, but he's leaning back. You can see his book is upside down, uh, indicating his earldom has been sequestered. Um, he, his hair is actually ragged. Um, but what about the cat? And his arm in a sling, again, part of his illness. The cat, well, this is very interesting. He is, this picture is, Southampton's picture was painted after he came out of the tower, obviously, by de Critz, the court painter, for James. And to James it says, I, like Essex, promoted your cause and I suffered for it. And don't forget it, and James didn't. He did very well under James. It shows that the Octavians, as they were called, from the 8th, the date of the rebellion, the Octavians were heroes when the Stuarts came to the throne, and, and he's celebrating this heroism. And to drive it home, he's connecting himself with this man, who, um, uh, Henry Wyatt, who did the same thing. He uh, opposed Richard III, and supported the claim of Henry VII and was tortured because of it. Uh, and the, the instruments of torture are actually in the Wyatt coat of arms. So the Wyatts kept this alive, of course, right the way through, their, their loyalty to the Tudor cause. So here is a man who suffered for the Tudor cause. How did he survive in prison? Well, if you look closely at that cat, this cat bought him pigeons. Pigeons, and, and he said to the jailer, if anyone brings me food, would you cook it? Jailer says, no one's likely to bring you food, but yes, I will. And so the supply of pigeons meant that this fellow survived. So uh, back to Southampton, I think that's the meaning of that cat. It's a reminder, James was not interested in cats. So we're looking now at a canny political operator with a very good bit of PR there, and it shows how, how bright Southampton was. Now, the true reading of that picture depends on that little uh, cartouche at the top right. It's been eradicated by his successors. The same is true of Shakespeare. If we eradicate the true meaning of the Essex Rebellion, if we eradicate the true nature of the opponents of Essex, if we eradicate uh, uh, the, the, the true personality and, above all, the massive appeal of Essex, we eradicate half the meaning of Shakespeare's works, including his two great masterpieces. And I will end it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>